we didn't have, we never worked with a budget. We just did the work. We never uh, wrote the reports, what we are going to do, or sometimes we wrote the projects, what we are going to do, but the next day we never followed them because uh, every day was something new. Now, was this because it was small enough that management could come around and talk to everyone, or was there just a certain amount budgeted and you I'll could use it up? I'll tell you, frankly, in, in my case, I never paid much attention to the management. The management told me many times, he says, how many are doing fine work? But you forget one thing, that you are working for all company. You ought to work with all, and you always work with pure hydrocarbons. So I finally, I got tired of listening to this criticism, so I got a can of oil on my shelf. And always I said, next occasion I have, I'll be using oil to do something with it. But uh, this occasion never arrived. And every 23 years after I left UOP, I told them to get rid of the can of oil. So you see, but I always try to give them something new. So by the time I left UOP, I gave them 145 US patents. So they were busy taking patents out, so they didn't have time to argue with me of what I'm doing. And uh, eventually I thought that uh, some of the things that we have done were profitable for UOP. So, I never uh, worked with the manager, I worked with the Pachev, and uh, he knew what I was doing. Now, as a department chairman at Chicago, what sort of a person was Stiglitz? What sort of a person was Stiglitz? Well, Stiglitz, uh, he was uh, educated, he was an American born from German parents, educated in Germany because his parents felt that in order to get good education, you have to go to German schools. So he was a very stiff man, you know, people were uh, not too approachable. But we became very good friends eventually because even before I got my PhD, I was yet uh, as strictly to referee the papers that I was sending to, uh, to JCS. And one of the papers was uh, Conjunct Polymerization, which uh, we published at the invitation of Kailash in the first volume of uh, Journal of uh, Organic Chemistry. But Stiglitz was my internal referee. He felt that conver converting of all of them to paraffin was a very uh, tremendous contribution. But he thought that the mechanism I proposed was terrible. I think he was right. I was wrong. But anyway, he told me, oh, regardless of what kind of mechanism you have, you have the facts there. And eventually, uh, with time, I was able to explain this better. And what I did not explain in my paper at that time, I was able to explain in 1981 when I published my book on the uh, catalytic, uh, uh, the chemistry of catalytic conversion reactions. So Stigley was very good and encouraged me very much to continue the type of work I was doing at UOP because without the knowledge of U UOP, I uh, gave him my papers to referee. But he died. Uh, uh, at the age of 67, and uh, two years before he died, right after he retired, from, became emeritus professor at uh, University of Chicago, he was engaged by Eglov as a consultant to UOP, so he gave lectures at UOP. He didn't consult much in the research, but just giving lectures. But he was uh, a very, uh, at least, I benefited that much from you, uh, from Stiglitz, and I consider that Stiglitz have done tremendous, uh, contributed quite a bit uh, to my career. By making possible for me to do that, I imagine 
no other patient would have done at that time. Did you know him personally outside of chemistry or his wife or children? Oh, his life was rather interesting, you know. Uh, but uh, I should not comment on some personal life because yes, it would be very interesting, but I'm not going to come. <coughs> Eventually, no. I would say after his wife died, he made his former student. But there, yes. was, a continu there was a continuous uh, uh, affair there, known to everybody at the University of Chicago. Well, I read about a debate that he had in the 1910s with a Cree who was at the U Johns Hopkins University over biocatalysis. Are you talking about Stiglitz? Yes. Yeah, Stiglitz was uh, he had an interesting fellow. He had uh, a face there, known to everybody in the department. The students, the, the girls, before they got married, Sigris called them in and told them how to take care of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so he was an interesting fellow. How did you do the research for your PhD thesis? I did it uh, with Kalash, who was the uh, discoverer of the free radicals in solution. I used to see him occasionally, maybe one every few months, because he was never there at night and I was never there during the daytime. Uh, but uh, I was working at the organometallic compounds, so I saw him from time to time and uh, I didn't have too, he did not influence me too much. We talked, shook hands and so on. Uh, I did it more or less uh, on my own, on my own leisure, I never had time. Uh, I finished my research everything in 1933. I got my PhD in 1935 because I didn't have time to write my thesis because the thing I had been doing at UOP was so exciting, so I wouldn't take time off to write my thesis, but eventually still this influenced me. He rushed me through. He said, you better write your thesis and get through with it. But, uh, it's not a good way to do research the way I did because I actually was not a part of the school. This was the best I could do under the influence. But I was, but uh, I got quite a bit, uh, from some contact with the students at night, I got something out of it. And not two years, uh, last year, I was very happy to find out that the University of Chicago uh, 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 presented me with the uh, alumni awards for uh, the research I have done, so I had, was very pleased to have it. But now I have it not only from the University of Chicago, but also I got uh, Anna de Yi from uh, Lyon, so from both schools, so I was very happy. Now, how did you come to go to Northwestern rather than the University of Chicago? Uh, Ipachev was at Northwestern University because Northwestern was responsible for Ipachev's coming here. Ipachev could not have come to United States without a, a, a academic visa. And Edlov was a good friend of Ward B. Evans, who, had that, who was connected to university, Northwestern University. So Northwestern University officially invited Ipachev as a lecturer to Northwestern University. And uh, he, as a lecturer, as a matter of fa fact, when Ipachev came to this country, he was obliged to lecture at Northwestern University. So he gave lectures in English without knowing English. So uh, he wrote his lectures in Russian. Someone translated it into English. He had a tutor there uh, that, to uh, that taught him how to pronounce things. So this is how he gave 
the weekly lectures for one semester at Northwestern University. And this met the legal obligations uh, of the party of towards Northwestern University. And since uh, and Ipachev eventually uh, uh, they invited eventually they invited Ipachev at his during his uh, two years later this was his seventieth or seventy fifth birthday they invited Ipachev to come to Northwestern University and open a lab. And uh, since the passion was in the West, Western University, and, uh, and he needed someone to help him in, t in conducting the research, he suggested to Northwestern University to invite me as a, an assistant professor so I could have students there. And this is how I got uh, to Northwestern University. So Northwestern didn't have anyone in catalysis before a pet yet? No, catalysis was not known uh, in Northwestern University. Ipachev came there in uh, 19, uh, officially as a lecture in 1937. He opened a little lab day. Uh, he has one student who was uh, 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 and also assistant uh, Val Hensel, who was there between 1971 and 1941, and he had one or two more students uh, at Northwestern. And uh, after he passed, as, as I mentioned before, after uh, Val Hensel uh, uh, got his PhD, he came to UOP. Uh, to the research group, and then Ipachev thought that maybe he should have someone on the faculty to help him out, and he thought that I would be, since he was used to work with me, and uh, he thought that I would be suitable uh, for this position, and finally he uh, persuaded Northwestern University to invite me as a faculty member. So I have been since 41 for the last what, 46 years at Northwestern. Now, did you take a salary cut or get an increase when you went no, to Northwestern? I, I didn't take a salary cut. They paid me, they didn't pay me too much. They could never afford to cut me more than <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I wasn't paid by Northwestern basically. This is the case. But uh, I had the privilege to work also on Saturdays. So I worked uh, twice as high for the same pay, but I never really get it. So um, uh, we eventually developed uh, a laboratory at Northwestern University, uh, uh, publishing, had many more students, developed a new lab, a teaching lab. Uh, UOP uh, was kind enough to continue paying my salary but they also got many patents based on the work on the discoveries that I made at Northwestern University. And uh, then after Ipacha died, there was a established a chair, uh, and this is how I came to Northwestern University on full time in January 1953. Now, was Burwell at Northwestern when you started there, or did he come after? No, Burwell was at Northwestern University since uh, before the war. During the time of the war, he had a, uh, he went to the army, he was in the Navy. So in 1950, uh, so he was at Northwestern University today. He, as a matter of fact, he was the first uh, I want to uh, collaborate, one of the first collaborators with the Apache for one year, working on silicophosphoric acid polymerization, and, uh, or not polymerization, was uh, conversion of alcohol to eaters uh, using silicophosphoric acid. He was waiting to have his laboratory equipped, and since the Apache had a laboratory there, 
he joined the Pasha, so he was with the Pasha for one year. Now, how well did you know Sir Hugh Taylor? Hugh Taylor? I saw Taylor uh, on many occasions. I didn't know him too well, but uh, uh, I heard him talk. I had a chance to talk with him, and uh, we had Taylor uh, uh, dedicating the high passion lab when I was uh, right after Ipatia died at the age uh, of 85, and Taylor dedicated that uh, was the main speaker. I, so I had contacts with, some contacts with Taylor, but I didn't know him too well. I, I knew, I knew, uh, uh, other people, I knew uh, Whitmer fairly well because I worked in, uh, with Assis and Whitmer was always interested with, uh, to discuss with me the type of work we had been doing. So we had, I had many discussions with Whitmer, uh, but Whitmer died early, so last time I saw him just before he died uh, at the ACS meeting and the physician told, uh, uh, he told me that the physician told him not to sit too long at the meeting, so we went aside and were able to discuss some research. So I knew Whitmer pretty well. Well, in the field of catalysis, who would you rank as people during your lifetime that were outstanding in catalysis? I was uh, in the non-academic world, uh, world, the outstanding man that I met was Beck. Uh, he was at Shell and he was working with, uh, uh, had, uh, with the labeled compounds, he was working with the uh, evaporated firms. He impressed me very much. Another one whom I knew fairly well were the Brother Farkasus who was working with uh, deuterium uh, 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 and we became uh, good friends with both Farkasus. Uh, uh, Bert Farkas is uh, having here in this country, but his uh, uh, older brother who was in Israel, I had many contacts with him. Uh, personal friends, as a matter of fact, we spent uh, a day together in New York just uh, a few months before he uh, was killed in the plane uh, in, uh, uh, on the way from Israel to Italy. And I always admired their work because they work uh, in Israel on uh, uh, with deuterium uh, and uh, auto power hydrogen, and they were actually in a small laboratory, very little equipment, completely isolated, so they did very fundamental work. Uh, so I felt that both focuses, uh, I respected their work. And uh, they were the pioneers in this field of. Uh, uh, also power hydrogen and deuterium. As a matter of fact, when I was working with deuterium in the world, I was using the floating system apparatus for measuring, uh, uh, measuring deuterium in, study, in studying uh, the mechanism of isomerization of butane to isobutane. And, uh, and other people, Paul Ahmed, so everybody knows about him, but uh, he was a man, extraordinary man. He was very helpful to me in being as examiner, a referee of my papers. I, he told me that he refereed, I sent once five or six papers to the journal on alumina, another 
paper on aromatization. He told me he gave a year about 10, 12 papers, and he put in a lot of time and uh, wonderful criticism. Uh, he was very helpful in this respect. As a person, he was a wonderful person. How well did you know Houdry? Houdry I knew because uh, uh, I met Houdri on many occasions. We always spoke French together, and uh, uh, I knew Houdri from the beginning. I remember when he came to UOP to, to, sell, to sell his prices, but no one wanted his prices because uh, he was working with clays at that time. It was not practical. Finally, he was able to sell his prices to some company. Uh, I spent with Hoodie quite a bit of time in 1956 during uh, uh, the first international congress in catalysis in Philadelphia. Hoodie lived outside of Philadelphia. Uh, uh, I remember we spent some time with the Russian delegation. This is the first time the Russian delegation came to this country and he invited the Russian delegation and both me and my wife for lunch, so we had a time to uh, to have a nice chat with all of them. And Hudri turned to my wife and whispered to her, and Mrs. Topsheva was in this country, and he said to, to my wife, he said, you know, you should do something and see that Mrs. Topsheva is dressed a little bit better than she is dressed, and, Hey, hey, do and so on. And he said, uh, money is not an ob objection. I think Heinemann had all the money at that time. So, so my wife went with Mrs. Topsheva, but her dresses for the party at the Hoodies took her over to the, uh, to the hairdresser in the, uh, some kind of department, fancy hairdresser to the department store, bought her some jewelry fake jewelry and so on. And she, and the, all this was under the influence of Houdri. And I met, then we had a nice party at Houdri's home with the Russians. I, we took the, I was the official host to the Russians because I, I spoke Russian. And... Uh, How did you come to learn Russian? I was born in Poland, and my parents came from the Russian part, so they spoke some Russian, but I never spoke Russian at home. But when the Pashev came, slowly the Russian I knew came back to me. And uh, at the beginning I spoke with the Pashev French, but he mixed his French with Germans and so finally, we, I switched to Russian, my very hesitant in me, and then uh, eventually my Russian became very uh, uh, fluid, and uh, that's all I converse with him Russian all the time. So how many languages do you speak now? Uh, I, I have a knowledge of his, uh, you ask me how many languages I speak well. I, I say I speak <laughs> languages, I don't know how well. I speak Polish, Russian, French, some German, English, and a little bit of Hebrew because I have been, uh, uh, after I became a Meritus professor, I established a lab uh, in Israel and I have been going there uh, twice a year, I spent nine months there, so I learned how to sp speak hesitant in the Hebrew too. I can understand it, but I don't speak it too fluently. But I can follow it, yes. They have, careful, they have to be careful what they say because about me because I can follow them. Now, when you were a professor, how did you select your graduate students? In my broken English. No, uh, how did you pick who was going to work with you as a graduate student? Oh, here? Yes. Oh, I picked the... Uh, they usually... 
show smear uh, uh, use, in order to be admitted to the university, not was a university, they have to be good students. So they as we give them a choice, they have a but half a year or so to choose the people they want to, uh, they want to work with. And since the catharsis was uh, uh, popular, and uh, people came to to work with me. We usually, I usually gave them the material, show them what I was working on, let them talk to other students, and this is how they chose. But I was fortunate to have good students, and many of my students did very well. At this conference, you have, uh, what, two, I think, two of my students are right here, both of them, with Tatsko Belinsky and Stanley Brown, they both I. I doing very well in industry, and my, as a matter of fact, Kobylinski was not my was my a postdoc. I met Kobylinski in Poland, and uh, I put him out of table. We traveled, traveled together to Lodz from Warsaw. He was given to me as uh, my guide in Poland. He was working with Professor Marin, uh, Malinowski, and, Malin, and Malinowski was my host. He invited me uh, uh, to Poland to be as a guest of the academy. And as we were traveling from Warsaw to Lodz, we stopped on the way and I was taking some pictures, people standing uh, in line. I think it was in a meat shop. Uh, I took a telephoto lens. I was wanted to see the expression of the people standing in line, and she sure now the militia and a motorcycle militia men came out and he wanted to, and he took us to the uh, to the post there, and they wanted to have the pictures there. I had no business taking pictures, and I wouldn't give you my. Camera. I said he, he took my password, but he had no business doing that either. So I said, I can I give you my camera? Oh, we'll develop it. I said, yes, you can develop, uh, you can do many things, but you cannot develop colored films because there is only one company in the United States that can do it. He said, oh, we can do everything. So I said, I'm sorry, I stood this idea which you cannot do it. And then I decided, uh, I said, all right, let me call up my embassy or, or, or the secretary of the Polish Academy. He said, telephone is out of order. <laughs> I talked Polish with him because I did not want to, him to believe that I'm hiding something. <laughs> so I sympathized with him for a while. I said, it must be very difficult for you to be without a telephone. But I said, I saw a post office, I tell you, I said, I'll call up from the post office. No, you cannot do it. I said, oh, I decided, you know. I said, what, the, am I under arrest? Oh, as long as you don't give me a use. Films. So I decided that he's bluffing, I'm going to bluff too. I said, I cannot afford to lose the picture of the Minister of Education and Minister and so on and so on. I never took pictures of the Minister of Education Day, but he thought, oh my, this fellow must be an important fellow. They took Ted uh, Kolobelsky, they took him to another room, and Ted told him, oh yes, this man is a very important man. I don't know. <laughs> so finally, this fellow said, to be the chief of police, was a little bit worried about it, so he came out, gave me this, my passport, my, my camera back, we shook hands, and he said, that's all a mistake. But they took Kobylinski's name, and Kobylinski was in trouble before, because when he was borrowing books from the embassy, English books, they took his name too. They told him he cannot borrow books. So he was on my conscience. And I worried about him. I actually worried. When Ted 
finally decided to come. I told him that he ever wanted to come to the United States to study to write to me. Whether he can join our idea as a postdoc, I was delighted. So I invited to come here, and this is why he's still here. So I was very much relieved that he came because I thought that I was going to cause a lot of trouble. He, they told, the chief of police told Kovalinsky, this man is a foreign correspondent and he's going to take pictures and tell people all about us. And you as a Pole, you ought to be ashamed of yourself to take him through these places. <laughs> So this is how Ted is here. Well, how many times have you been back to Poland? One, that's enough. That was? I, I'll tell you, I went to Poland to see the ghetto and the monument and see, uh, and see the wall and see the places and uh, just to see one my family how I wanted to know what actually happened to them. And I wanted to see the monument that he created. So it was a journey, not a pleasure journey, but a journey that I wanted to see what went out, went on. And uh, the Poles eventually were not too kind. You know, in 1967, they chased all the Jewish professors from the university and the only the mere fact that they were Jews, so I decided that I lost interest to even to, to take students because until then I had Polish students. I thought I would have out with the economy and education Poland. But then they removed uh, uh, the professors by mere fact that they were Jews, and some of the best ones. I lost all interest in uh, collaborating with them. And this is uh, uh, when Solidarity came into power, I found an article in the newspapers uh, wondering why not, no one ever investigated the reason why all the professors and artists and writers and uh, composers they are moved from their position by the new fact that they were Jewish. What to go back to catalysis? Um, or would you like to take a break and continue sometime later this week? Big egg in catalysis now? Well, uh, are you getting tired or? No, I'm never tired. I always I wonder and quite often what people are doing in catalysis because. Nowadays, they study mostly uh, surface, uh, uh, surface uh, solid state and surface reactions. Uh, they go study catalysis and molecular and maybe <coughs> eventually <coughs> atomic basis. But I often wonder, reading the Journal of Catalysis and attending the meeting today, that they may be are using compounds, uh, that catalysis is a reaction mostly kinetics, because what you are studying, a catalysis is speeds up the rate of the reaction. They are studying surfaces. They are studying by the most sophisticated instruments, but I did not see too many new reactions being discovered. Uh, I'll show you an example, take uh, two examples uh, from my own experience. One example is alumina. I never had any sophisticated equipment, but I used to use uh, complicated organic models, probes. And from this we discovered that alumina has intrinsic acidic and basic sides. And I was able to demonstrate it by organic probes. It took 25 years to discover by the sophisticated instrumentations that alumina has acidic and basic sides. We found it years back. Another example of nickel. 
we find nickel containing small amount of nickel oxide in it, not much, one to one and a half percent, has intensely acidic and basic size and can carry out catalytic reactions that have never done before, like for instance converting neopen to alcohol to neopen to methane. You can do it on nickel. Neopentobetae was never prepared before because you cannot, people could not do it catalytically because in the presence of any acidity, skeletal isomerization takes place. We prepared overnight about 150 cc of pure dineopentobetae. I think Ted Kobolinsky did it when he was a supposed egg in our lab. The same thing applied to platinum and other things. So this kind of things decides you cannot uh, discover using instrumentation only. And it bothers me that people do not use organic probes, organic, organic reaction to discover the size. As a matter of fact, a few years ago I was invited to Berkeley by Samuel Jai. And I asked him, what do you want me to do with you? People know about catalysis. He said, no, we want you to tell us how you do research and why you were successful using model compounds to discover new sites. For that, people ought to study a little bit more organic chemistry. And uh, nowadays, I, I would say uh, most of the catalysis is, is in the hands of chemical engineers, most of them do not have enough background of organic chemis uh, in chemistry. The only one that I found who has very good background and accomplishes quite a bit is Alex Bell. And I asked him, he's uh, the head of chemical engineering at the University of uh, at Berkeley. He said when he was at MIT, his professor told him, in order to be a good chemical engineer, one should take as much chemistry as one can. And this is the answer. They do beautiful work. They, and single crystals and other things. But I did not find many new reactions coming out lately <coughs> with all the money is being spent in catalysis and equipment. Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I still feel that people should do some use organic probes. So you want to yeah. take a break, or we'll do some more okay, okay. later? I'll come out. <laughs> <laughs>